Okay, hello everyone. And yeah, uh, as Nico said, I'm Alex, um, and I'm also presenting on behalf of my collaborators, Nathan, Maliha, and Rafal. This is a collaboration between Meta and the University of Liverpool and the University of Cambridge. And I'm going to talk today about flicker and the critical flicker frequency. So flicker for a light source that has a refresh, like for example a display or some types of indoor lighting, is when the, um, when the refresh rate is too low, and then instead of looking like a stable, you know, continuous source like maybe was desired, it looks, appears to be flickering and going on and off. And the critical flicker frequency then is the refresh rate at which that stops happening, and instead things appear continuous and, you know, and, and as they were intended. Um, now, the thing is, most of the studies for Flickr historically were done thinking of types of displays or types of content that, you know, fit one mold, like, for example, have a certain luminance profile, but with new technologies that appear, like high dynamic range, um, you know, displays that are very bright, uh, those values, you know, may change. And so, you know, so, so this could become relevant. And one other important factor is the field of view. So, for example, um, virtual reality displays that we care a lot about at Meta, um, they have a much higher field of view than, you know, traditional displays. And that is another factor that also could affect your Flickr uh, sensitivity. So, with that, I want to talk about a special prototype that we had at Meta um, that helped us study Flickr. And I'll do a quick introduction of that, and then um, you'll, you'll understand why I'm bringing it up. So, this is something that my colleagues at Meta have been working on for a while. So, first, you know, HDR virtual reality prototypes, you know, on the bench top, kind of um, you know, bare bones there in 2018. Eventually we had demonstrators in 2021 that were still you know, somewhat rough. And um, in last year, so in 2022, we had a, a more polished kind of professional looking demonstrator. We call this Display Starburst. Um, and in fact, we showcased it at SIGGRAPH um, last year in Vancouver, and it even won the Best in Show Award for the ETEC portion of that conference. Um, now let me tell you a little bit about how this prototype is constructed and what's special about it. So this is a quick overview of the, um, you know, of the hardware. So on the right side we have the tracking cameras, and that's just used to know where the user is looking so the content can be adapted appropriately. Um, next we have the okay. next we have the LED backlights, and it's one sixty watt LED per eye, and that's really bright. Um, Afterwards, we have some illumination optics that help collimate the light towards the user so that less is lost. And then we have an LC, which is the imager. We actually have a dual LC system, so we have a monochrome and a color. And the reason for that is so that the black level does not rise too much with such a bright backlight. By having dual modulation, we're able to preserve better contrast. Um, and the monochrome and, and, and uh, color ones, um, the reason for that difference is because the color um, imager has too low transmissivity, so we want to achieve as high as possible maximum brightness while still keeping good contrast. Um, finally, we have the IP, so, so the lens just puts the display at the correct distance from the viewer. And of course, as you might have noticed, the display is pretty bulky. That's because of the backlight heat sink and also of the cooling fans that move the air to keep those, the energy dissipating from those powerful backlights. So here's a final spec sheet for this device. And I think the most important thing is the first line. The maximum brightness is just about 21,000 nits. And for reference, uh, commercially available virtual reality headsets are usually around 100 or maybe 200 taking that from the published literature, okay? Um, and for example, the PQ container, right, which is the, um, the data format for HDR, you know, high quality HDR content, usually is spec to about 10,000 nits. So this is a really, really large value for a display. Um, there's measures of sequential and, and checkerboard contrast that I'm not gonna go into too much. Uh, the resolution is about in line with commercially available displays. And importantly, the field of view is a little bit less than most commercially available displays, about 62 degrees horizontal and vertical. And of course, the weight is uh, two and a half kilos, which is very heavy. Oh, and one more important thing is the refresh rate. So you might notice here, the refresh rate of these LCs is relatively low, and that just comes with the limitations of what we needed to do to make it so bright. But since we're going to study flicker, flicker is usually studied with um, a stimulus that is turned on and off completely, and we happen to have a, a backlight modulator that was in the several kilohertz range, okay? So specifically for this study, as we can keep the image static and turn the backlight on and off, we're able to do that essentially at any uh, rate that, that we wanted in this case. Here's an overview of somebody just using this device for a different study that we've done recently. Um, and now this, this one wasn't on Flickr, but I just want to show it to you how it works. You can see it's suspended from a paracord. That's to make it easier for the user not to have to carry that weight because it is, you know, uh, not form factor. Um, but they're still able to walk around, kind of looks a little bit like a submarine, but um, you, you still feel like you're in VR and, and immersive in that sense. Um, and the results of, of that study specifically, I'll just mention it here quickly. This was something we presented in SIGGRAPH Asia um, in December. Um, 
was about the realistic luminance in VR, the preferences of users. If they could have any luminance, what would they like to have in virtual reality? And this is um, kind of like the, the simple version of those results, is that they had non-trivial preferences. You know, without any prompting from us, they picked different values for scenes that are indoors or outdoors, you know, that actually have different real luminance values in the world, and it sort of followed in a way in their preference. And those values also are much higher than what today's displays were able to do. So it seems that there is some interest for really broad Right, virtual reality to be more realistic and more immersive. And so that, of course, gets us thinking of whether that'll also bring additional challenges, like, for example, some artifact might become more visible, right? Um, such as Flickr, which is what we're talking about today. So with that, um, let's, let's go back to Flickr then. So we have this device, and it's extremely bright, and it's virtual reality. It has a relatively large field of view. Um, but what has been done with Flickr in the past? What's the prior art? So. When we talk about Flickr, the most popular model is the Ferry Porter Law. So that's basically a model that says that Flickr, uh, that, that critical Flickr fusion parameter is log linear in luminance. So it is a linear function of the log of the luminance. Okay? Now, this has been you know, studied quite a bit, and there's a lot of data for it. Um, most studies sort of report CFFs in, in some range of 50 to 70 for day vision. But when we really go into those studies and we start looking at what were the luminances that were examined, um, we find that, generally speaking, people haven't really gone too much above 1,000 nits. There were some cases, like uh, not, um, specifically there, Kelly in 1964, that did go to a higher value, but due to the type of stimulus, which was a stabilized stimulus, the sensitivity is much lower, and it doesn't match the typical kind of free viewing conditions that users would experience in this kind of device. So... Uh, notably here, the, the highest one that we found, the most relevant one, was this work from Hecht and Verip from 1933, which is 90 years ago, so uh, cool that it's uh, still so relevant today. Um, and you can see an interesting bit there in the plot is that it doesn't seem like those data points are following the, the line. They're not necessarily following the Ferry Porter law. So it gets us thinking, um, you know, maybe that, that law does not necessarily hold at those high luminances, okay? Um, and then just another thing to mention here for the ferry portal is that it also holds for different eccentricities. So if you were to repeat the study with the stimulus not uh, being foveated, uh, you would still get a line, but at a different um, inclination. Now, in terms of different prior art, like we, we sort of have an idea that the saturation at high luminance and maybe even a reversal and a reduction in sensitivity could happen. For example, we had an indication of this from recent work by Verger et al. in 2020, where they measured a contrast sensitivity function for just spatial stimuli, so no, no temporal component. And in that case, you can see the sensitivity seems to rise and then eventually decline after around 1,000 nits. So, you know, so it seems like there's a little bit of, of, of a precedent for something similar to happen. And this type of, of uh, factor has already been modeled, for example, in our recent work with, uh, with Rafal and Maliha on Stella CSF, which is a contrast sensitivity model that uh, can predict this type of thing. But for temporal um, aspects, it's not as clear as for spatial. So now I'm um, going to move on and talk about what, what did we actually do. So what did we study in our subjective study? Okay. Um, we had 15 participants, and then we had six additional participants in a small follow-up for a full field, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, we used the method of adjustment procedure, so people just kind of adjusted until they couldn't see the flicker anymore. And these are all internal participants, so uh, they were you know, well-trained and, and kind of like sort of professionals of, of this field, so we hope they, they did a good job of it. Um, to avoid hysteresis, we also repeat each trial twice, um, one starting at a very high frequency uh, where you do not see any flicker, and the other one at a very low frequency where you certainly see it. Um, you can see on the bottom left the controls from our study, so we just used those handles of the device. They have buttons built in, and we had, um, we had some good controls for people there. And on the bottom right, you can see what the stimulus would look like, and specifically in this case, it's a stimulus that isn't foveated. In that case, we add a low-luminance fixation cross in the center, and we ask the users to, to look at it. And it was monocular presentation, right eye only, uh, nasal. Okay? Um, in terms of our variables, what we had there is you see the luminances. We had 10, and then after that we had log steps from 100 to 8,000, uh, getting 10 conditions in total, which is what we were able to do in a reasonable amount of time. The reason we added 10 is we wanted more overlap with existing data sets at low luminances. Um, the eccentricities were 0, 10, and 20 degrees. Um, the headset only had 60 degrees field of view, so it's about you know, 30 to each side. And if you go all the way to the extremes, then the optics start uh, introducing significant distortion that we couldn't compensate for. Um, and the size of the stimulus was either one degree, which is pretty small and kind of in line with the literature, um, or we magnified it using a cortical magnification model, so we made it bigger for eccentric stimuli uh, to try to compensate for, um, for the reduction in, in uh, receptor um, frequency. 
Okay, so here's a schematic of our first result. And on the left, you can see sort of this is the case for the foveal, so the person is looking right at it and it's one degree. And you can see there in our results on the x axis, we have luminance, and it seems like, um, you know, the CFF goes up according to the Ferry Porter law, but then after, you know, around uh, 1,000 or maybe 4,000 years, there is a decrease. And then eventually, it does look like it goes up a little bit. That's a sort of um, open question whether that really happens. You can see that our procedure also had a little bit of noise. So it's not, you know, we're not putting too much weight into some of these results because they're not necessarily significantly different from each other. Um, okay. Here's a result for a one degree stimulus, so no magnification at an eccentricity of 10 degrees. And you can see a similar picture as before, but at a lower um, sensitivity overall. And finally, a similar result for 20 degrees. And once again, we have lower sensitivity. In this case, it does seem to follow the Ferry Porter law, but then again, because of the, of the error in the measurement and the very, very um, horizontal slope of the line, um, it, it, it also is perfectly possible that it does level off in a similar way as the um, other conditions. And here's the other case, which is the cortically magnified case. So in this, uh, this is only for the eccentric stimuli, um, like non-foveated. And so in this case, we try to use Ravarma's model uh, to get the, the size of the stimulus that would be equivalent. And what we get there is a uh, much higher uh, sensitivity that is more or less in line with the foveal one. Uh, and we still get that, that interesting nonlinear behavior at the high luminances. And something similar happens for 20 degrees as well. Um, although. I can tell you from experience that condition is more difficult <laughs> to perform, and so once again, we get a little bit of noise in our results. Here's a different look at these um, experimental results, but plotted in a different way. So on the top plot, we have the results for only the 10 degree condition, so the non foveal condition of 10 degrees of eccentricity, for the two sizes that we've examined. And there's kind of like a positive relationship with size. So a bigger stimulus is you're more sensitive to. It makes perfect sense in, in line with the literature, so, so, so that's fine. Um, in the bottom case, we have the same thing for 20 degrees. Again, this is sort of expected. There's a question there of whether those slopes are similar or different and whether that can be modeled. Like, for example, I think there is a, a paper by Granite and Harper uh, that does something similar. Because we only examine two conditions and because, um, you know, again, because of, of the type of collection this was, it's not very easy to model this, but we hope this data can go sort of into the bank for, uh, to help people model uh, these types of behaviors in the future. And here's another way of plotting this. So on the top, we have the case with cortical magnification. And on the x-axis, we have increasing eccentricity. And on the y-axis, we have the CFF. And it seems like when the stimulus is cortically magnified, the sensitivity does go up a bit with eccentricity. As an engineer, I definitely hear a lot of um, engineers discussing you know, how much better our temporal vision is in the periphery and how we're so amazing you know, at seeing movement. And there's tigers leaping out of the, um, you know, of the bushes at, at the primitive man. And so they, you know, they, they evolve in this way. I'm not 100% sure about this. You know, this, this result seems to indicate that there is an increase in sensitivity that is in line with some studies. For example, Tyler from 1987 showed a similar increase. However, other studies like Hartman's in 79, uh, Rivamps in 84, or Krianich in 21 uh, did not show this effect. So um, the jury is sort of out on that one. Um, there could be other reasons why it could increase. For example, cortical magnif magnification may be um, not exactly accurate, or maybe there could be something about the display. But this, is, um, this result kind of goes in that evidence pile for perhaps there being more flicker sensitivity in the periphery. And the bottom case is the case where there isn't cortical magnification, so these are all one degree stimuli, and then as they go into the periphery, the sensitivity decreases. And that is in line with the literature, I think. Okay, we did one more case that was kind of interesting, which is specifically something that matters for, for virtual reality and, and for product, in a way, which is a full field um, flicker. So in this case, the stimulus was the entire screen was just turned on to white, and we make it um, uniform to up to about just over 20 degrees, and then after that it kind of rolls off a little bit with the vignette becoming more extreme, but not in a very noticeable way. Um, and we showed it uh, to our participants and got a, an interesting result there. It does follow the Ferry Portal law. It does not go down. It's about 15 hertz over the, the small stimulus size. Um, and so you got some pretty high uh, CFF values for this case. And this is important for things like uh, web browsing or if you um, have some sort of loading screen that is you know, very bright in a headset, you might actually then perceive you know, flicker at, at pretty high frequencies in, in this type of cases. Um, and the ferry portal here, ferry portal law appears to be uh, valid across the entire range. So, okay, to conclude, some quick conclusions then from this talk. Um, we gathered a high luminance CFF data set for different uh, retinal locations and sizes. 
CFF saturates at around 1,000 nits for disks, but not for the full field stimulus, and that one follows the Fairy portal law up to about 8,000 nits. Um, the CFF decreases with eccentricity for the constant stimulus sizes, but increases in our data uh, if the size is adjusted using cortical magnification. Uh, for future work, it would be interesting to investigate additional influences, like, for example, uh, background luminance, you know, that could be relevant for traditional display, um, or just different colors as well. Uh, this was, of course, just black and white. Um, and finally, uh, Rafal presented earlier another one of, of our papers on modeling contrast sensitivity of disks, and this is a disk data set. Now, this type of exploration of temporal sensitivity at high luminances would be very interesting to integrate with existing models of um, temporal perception and you know, spatiotemporal CSF data and things like that. Perhaps we can use uh, the type of modeling we've done in that paper um, to help integrate this kind of uh, data set into our understanding of temporal vision. So thank you very much. This QR code will take you to my page where the uh, manuscript is, so feel free to, to read it, and I'm always happy to answer any questions now or offline. All right.